Okay. Well, um, you know, I like Doug Massey's book, Categorical Inequality, uh, and um, I think he has many very useful points. Um, one of the issues on which I, I think I kind of part ways from him is what I take as his overvaluation of policy and overestimation of what policy can do. And um, as you looked at my book that uh, I, I had asked you to uh, read, uh, Controls and Choices, one of the central themes of that book is the limitations of what you can achieve through policy. Um, Doug Massey says at one point, uh, if my memory serves me correctly, categorical inequality was created by what people, things that people did, that people made categorical inequality. Therefore, people can unmake categorical inequality. And that statement, uh, you know, although I like his book, that particular statement seemed to me so simplistic as to be almost fatuous. That is that um, social situations that are the consequence of innumerable decisions made by innumerable people in different social circumstances over the course of centuries can be undone just by someone making a decision and changing policy. Uh, to my mind, this is an example of what I would call the Captain Picard approach to social issues. Do you know who Captain Picard was? Nowadays, the second Star, Star, Star Trek series is kind of ancient history. Uh, Captain Picard was the captain of the Starship Enterprise. And when he wanted something done, he would say, make it so. And the crew of the Enterprise would run to carry out his will. And then, you know, what he had ordered would happen, right? And I kind of question this make it so approach to social issues. That is, the idea that we can decide that we want a certain social outcome and simply pass a policy or um, make a directive and we'll get the outcome we want. And there are some reasons that I think that it's not so simple as simply making a decision and then saying, make it so, right? One of them is that as Karl Marx said, although people make their own destinies, they don't make them within situations of their own choosing. One of the reasons that policy is not all powerful is that we make our decisions within environments. And indeed, environments shape the decisions that we make. Uh, in other words, there is political sociology in addition to politics. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. Um, there's also within social structures, the problem of pluralism. And what I mean by pluralism is within any complex society, you have different people with different goals and these goals are often in conflict or in tension and represent what the political thinker Isaiah Berlin called incommensurate values or incommensurate ends. Um, as I recall, Isaiah Berlin using the example of the current state of Israel and the problems or, or the state of Israel in his day. Uh, and he pointed out that both Palestinians and Israelis have goals, have ends, have political desires. And these ends, these goals and political desires are completely understandable. And you might argue that the goals of both sides are legitimate, 
The problem is they're incommensurate. They don't go together, right? That in a complex and pluralistic society, you have different people with different goals and different ends. And so you can never simply say, make it so and get the results that you want. Not only do you have people with different goals and different ends, but also there are different interests. And people have interests even beyond their own values. In the work on the sociology of education that I did, and you know, today we're looking at that primarily in terms of its political implications, my co-author and I essentially argue that one of the reasons that school desegregation didn't work as well as it should have was that the ends it sought to bring about were in conflict with the real interests of people who were pursuing their own interests and goals, and that even if those interests were not consistent with the stated values of those people, they would pursue their own interests. That, in other words, you can't simply direct and control a society the way that you would a starship. And that's, I, I think, where the idea of markets comes in. Uh, in the, the, uh, the book Controls and Choices, I found it sometimes misunderstood. It sometimes uh, thought that my colleague and I were arguing that a free market approach is normatively the right approach to human issues, which is actually not at all what we were arguing. We were not arguing in that markets are desirable. We were arguing that markets are inescapable, that you always have market forces precisely because people are seeking their own goals. Now, let's uh, spend a little bit of time and think about what political sociology is. You know, we had started off this semester talking about one of the, the early social theorists, Thomas Hobbes, who essentially argued that government comes about because in a, a natural state where people are pursuing their own ends, every person is at the mercy of every other person. And because we're inherently selfish, a natural state is one of anarchy, one of each person seeking to realize her or his own benefits over and above those of other people. Now, there are some good points, I think, that, that Hobbes makes. One of those is something that we often overlook in contemporary social sciences, that is, the problem of order, right? That it isn't simply how goods and power are distributed, that it isn't simply the good, how goods and power are distributed, that is the only issue we should consider in social sciences, right? There's also the problem of order and what brings about order. And one of the most important issues in political sociology, I think, is what creates social order and what kind of society has what kind of order? Um, in what kind of society do you have people who are routinely shooting each other, which is an, something we actually find, right? And in what kind of society do people live peaceably and cooperate with each other, regardless of what the distributional questions may be. So, you know, I think there were some useful points for, the, for political sociology 
within the ideas of Hobbes. One of the great limitations, though, was that he really didn't have a concept of society. His explanation of social order was that people were terrified of each other, therefore they would hand power over to an authority. Well, of course, that raises the question of if people can't cooperate to begin with, how do they decide to hand power over to an authority? But there's also the problem, I think, that it isn't simply government that creates social order. That social order also comes about, or even more preeminently comes about because of the arrangement of a society. And in fact, I think you could argue that it isn't politics that yields society so much as society yields politics. Governments exist within societies. Societies do not exist within governments. Now, that's not to say that Governments don't influence society, but it does mean that political decision making responds to forms of society more than forms of society respond to political decision making. Now, um, maybe to make this idea of political sociology a little bit clearer, we can move forward from Hobbes a couple of centuries and talk about a critical political sociologist that is Alexis de Tocqueville, this handsome man in the picture here. Alexis de Tocqueville, some of you may have read his classic Democracy in America, where he talked about the nature of American democracy. The way to read that, I think, is as a work of political sociology. That is, as a, an attempt to look at how does a particular kind of society yield a particular kind of government? And what is it about American society that makes democracy possible. So it isn't within the Tocqueville's work that government makes decisions and shapes a democratic society. It's that you have a democratic society and therefore you have a government that comes out of that democratic society. The Tocqueville was the child of French nobility in both sides of his family. Uh, he was a uh, descendant of the French nobility. One of his grandfathers defended Louis the 16th, the last um, uh, king of France before the revolution when Louis the 16th was accused of treason. Uh, and not only did Louis the 16th lose his head, but de Tocqueville, de Tocqueville's grandfather also lost his head for defending him. Uh, and so, you know, this is kind of the background behind de Tocqueville's thinking. Um, in, the, in, in 1831, de Tocqueville received a commission to come to the United States to study how Americans were dealing with the problem of crime. And the United States was thought at that time to be in the advance guard of how you respond to crime. The United States had a new approach to dealing with criminals, a reformatory approach known as the penitentiary. The penitentiary was a place that you do penance. 
The idea was that if you isolate prisoners and give them time to reflect on their wrongdoing, you can gradually reintegrate them into society. Well, uh, I think that didn't work. And that actually is another topic that is criminology. So at any rate, de Tocqueville and his friend, Gustave de Beaumont, came to the United States to study prisons. And de Tocqueville quickly lost interest in prisons. The report was eventually written, but Beaumont wrote it for de Tocqueville. Instead, de Tocqueville became interested in the issue of democracy in America and why it is that apparently the United States had succeeded in achieving an egalitarian, more relatively egalitarian society that his own native France had not. Why in some respects did the American Revolution succeed while the French Revolution did not? And de Tocqueville developed a, a great deal of respect for American political life. Uh, there's a caveat there, de Tocqueville only liked a part of America. Like, if you say that society creates government, like, and I see that, like, with the revolution, but then if we move past that, when America became a democracy, like, an immigration started happening, all of these different people, like, came to America and people continue to flock to America because of the fact that we are a democracy and, like, they're changing society, but they chose the society because of the government structure. Do you understand what I'm asking? Yeah, yeah. Actually, um, I, I, I'm not sure that's entirely accurate. Um, immigrants migrate for a lot of different reasons. Yeah. The primary reason usually, though, is economic opportunity. But doesn't government create that or has a hand in that? So it's connected to government is kind of... That's a good question. I, I would say no. I would say no. The governments don't create equal economic opportunity, they respond to it. Maybe they can contribute to economic opportunity and they could develop, and they can adopt policies that foster greater economic opportunity. But uh, it's a little bit off the, off the subject, not, not completely though, because it deals with this question of the environment. I would say that the reason immigrants came to the United States was economic opportunity here that they lacked in their home countries. Now, politics is not irrelevant to that, right? Uh, political institutions can contribute to of affluence or not, but still the affluence in the United States didn't come because the, the American government said, well, we're going to have an affluent society. It doesn't mean that the US government did nothing. For example, the US government did subsidize the building of the railroads. And the building of the railroads was essential to the industrialization of the United States. But it was really the industrialization of the United States that brought the immigrants here. And the role of government was essentially to contribute to that industrialization. So government was certainly playing a part in it. But the immigrants were coming here because, primarily because of our form of government. I'm just thinking like the economy tied to like democracy versus like other forms like communism or totalitarianism is like the government allows the economy to be the way it is, whereas it's not the same in yeah, society. Yeah, um, and that's like an attractive feature connected to economy. Like that's kind of what I'm thinking. Like they yeah, choose this I, kind of society because of the freedom, but that freedom is connected to the government. Yeah, it certainly is true that government can act in ways that contribute to economic growth or inhibit economic yeah. growth. Um, now, the role of, of, say, communism in responding to economic situations is, is a complicated one. I mean, if we take all of the totalitarian societies, if you look, for example, at the Soviet Union, it emerged out of the collapse of, of Russia, something that the communists did not create, right? 
uh, and they occupied a place in um, the control of the country. So it's essentially that they're able to take power because of developments in the larger society, right? That the country collapses and therefore a totalitarian system emerges out of a state of anarchy. Right? This is, I think, one of the responses to Marx uh, about why it is that communism didn't develop in the most um, advanced capitalist countries that instead it emerged in places that the country had, had that in which the countries had essentially fallen apart. Uh, that is, it's social disorder that creates a demand for more highly centralized authority. Now, I think you could argue that it does make a Hobbesian point, right? That when things fall apart, that's when governments that attempt to be highly centralized emerge or say in Italy following the First World War, when the fascists came to power, they came to power because of social disorder in Italy. But you know, you see in both of those cases that it's the social situation that creates the government, not the government that creates the social situation, which again, doesn't mean that governments are irrelevant. And it doesn't mean that they can't do anything to contribute to the society, but governments respond to their environment. And the environment of the United States in the late 19th century that brought the immigrants here was one of rapid industrialization. Now that's something important to keep in mind because we'll talk in a few minutes about our current situation and what kind of situation we find ourselves in today. You know, I would, uh, I'm going to argue that the equivalent of industrialization of the United States in the, in the late 19th and early 20th centuries is the financialization of the American economy. In other words, the emergence of the United States, not as an industrial center, but as a financial center. All right, well, the Tocqueville was interested in the 1830s in looking at the nature of American democracy and in looking at what is it that made the American, the American political system, the American social system possible. Um, now, you know, there is a, like a, a caveat here, and that is the America that de Tocqueville liked was essentially New England and the Eastern seaboard states. That is, especially New England. That is the free states. He really, really, really did not like the slave states and was intensely opposed to slavery. And in fact, when he made a journey south and came to a place called New Orleans, he strongly disapproved of that part of the United States. But the really interesting part about the Tocqueville's analysis, the political sociology, that is the idea of, so of a social order coming out of the society itself, instead of from government was a key theme in democracy in America. And it's also, I think, that you, something that you can find repeated again and again today in the social capital literature and in works like Robert Putnam's Bowling Alone. When de Tocqueville looked at what made democracy work, more than anything else, he pointed to Americans' habit of joining, that Americans were a nation of people who voluntarily participated with each other, that it was the prevalence of voluntary associations that cultivated the habit for democracy and also made cooperation possible. 
not only did being a member of a lot of different clubs, a lot of different organizations, volunteer fire organizations, local governments, inculcate the habit of public participation, but also they created cross-cutting ties. And by cross-cutting ties, I mean that if you have a lot of different organizations, nobody's gonna be all on one side or all on another side. That if you have a community in which people are highly engaged and highly involved in a lot of public activities, you don't have polarization. You don't have everybody on one side or everybody on another side. Now, this is interesting because essentially what he's arguing is that American democracy is made possible at the grassroots level. It's made possible by the participation of people. It is the organization of the society that makes possible a political order and not political decisions, primarily that make possible the organization of the society. Now, there is an implication of that. One of those implications is that we would have to think very carefully about the idea of democracy for expert. Is democracy something that you can simply send somewhere else and you can draw up a, um, a constitution and a country will become democratic simply because you've drawn up the constitution? If we accept the Tocquevillian view, we would say, no, the countries become democratic, not because some set of founders, however wise, design the right government, but because they're fortunate enough to have a social order that fosters cooperation and participation. Now, admittedly, that leaves open the question of where does this society come from, uh, which is an issue that needs, um, uh, that, that um, requires greater investigation and greater consideration. Now, the Tocqueville also implicitly contrasted American democracy with what was happening, with what had happened in his own country, in France. France had had a revolution not long after the American Revolution. In fact, those two events were probably connected to some extent because um, the bankruptcy of the French monarchy was in part a consequence of investment in activities like helping out the revolution in America. But de Tocqueville maintained that the reason that France had not become the kind of successful democracy that America had was because of something about those, the grassroots organization of society. De Tocqueville essentially maintained in his uh, book, The Old Regime and the French Revolution, that before the French had had their revolution, the French monarchy had centralized its power. When we talked about education, we talked about the fact that um, if we look at many European countries, they tend to be much more centralized than the United States, which has good sides and bad sides, right? For France, what this centralization meant was that all of the, the local institutions, the local leadership had essentially been bought off and gone to France. And those local societies were essentially run from the center by administrators of the crown. What that meant is that after the revolution, they essentially lopped off, not only in a literal sense, but also in a, um, in, in a metaphorical sense, 
all of the leadership of those local communities and called for everyone to be equal, but they were equal in a society in which there was no political sociological order. In other words, the French people were atomized individuals before that centralized government. And as atomized individuals, that is, as individuals who did not have those grassroots organizations, they were in a state of equality before some kind of central government. And so the emergence of Napoleon, one might argue, in fact, people have argued this, was a consequence of the fact that all the French people were equal, but being equal meant that they had no local hierarchies, they had no local organizations, they were fragmented and instead tied on to a single individual at the center. This has significance, I think, for us today, because next week when we talk about polarization and populism, populism is essentially individuals who don't have connections in their own society being focused on someone at the center. Okay, so one of the questions of political sociology is, what kind of society yields a political order that is of maximal efficacy and will actually work in the day-to-day -day lives of those citizens? And you know, if you take this idea of the engagement of citizens, the political order doesn't rest on simply on voting, and it doesn't rest simply on policymakers making the right decisions. Instead, it rests on all of those different individuals in all of those different places. Now, there's also, I think, a, uh, a problem here. There's a complication, and that is, in a sense, the American society that de Tocqueville was looking at in the 19th century was much less pluralistic than our society today. The differences were primarily between the free states and the slave states. Now, what pluralism does is that it introduces a plurality of goals, a plurality of interests. And if you have a plurality of goals, that's also a problem for decision making because a plurality of goals means that you can't get everyone to agree on everything. And if you can't get everyone to agree on everything, then compromise and a willingness to accept imperfection and a willingness to live with Frustration is essential to national life. Okay, so there is this question of what kind of social order creates a political order? The other question is what kind of environment is a social order responding? responding to. You know, when we talked about um, the evolutionary ecological approach to societies, we talked about the fact that societies are essentially responses to how people make their livings. You have a, um, a, a hunting and gathering society, you have a particular kind of social order. You have a, an agricultural society. You have another social order. You have an industrial society, and there is another social order. And of course, because there are differences among industrial societies, there are variations in kinds of social order. So 
maybe the question that we want to ask is what kind of social order, what kind of environment are we responding to today? Putting that in the context, putting that in the context of this ecological evolutionary approach, that is that the shape of society derives from how we make our livings, we would have to think not only about how did the United States change in, with industrialization in the late 19th century? How did it change from the Tocqueville's day? But also, how is it changing today? You know, probably the most obvious characteristic of late capitalism, the late market society in the United States is the emergence of corporate capitalism. That is the emergence of corporate societies. Corporate societies consisting of a corporate society consisting of big business, big labor, increasingly mediated by big government. And really, when we think about what we classically talk about as, quote, the American dream, a lot of that is rooted in a corporate social order in which corporations pay relatively high wages to their workers because they need a well-organized and stable workforce. Workers influence corporations through their membership in unions and other kinds of work organizations. You know, Doug Massey had talked about the heyday of unions in the United States. I would argue that um, it isn't just that unions were prevalent uh, in from the 1930s to the 1960s because government had passed um, in 1935 a law recognizing the right of collective bargaining. But instead, unions were influential because this was a part of the corporate society. And government was a part of that corporate society, both as a mediator between business and labor, and also as a subsidizer of both business and labor. Now, what was it that caused the corporate society the corporate capitalist society to begin to, if not come apart, at, at least fray. My argument would be that it's a change of the United States in its place in the world economy. If, for example, you were going to buy a car in the early 1950s, in the United States, what kind of car would you have bought? A Ford, a Chevrolet, an American-made car. Not only would you have bought that kind of car in the United States, but chances are everywhere in the world outside of the Iron Curtain, people would have bought a Ford, a Chevrolet, a General Motors car, in other words, the United States was the industrial power for the world. And this is what creates unionization. This is what shapes what we often think of as that period of egalitarian capitalism. When did that begin to come apart? One way to think about that and to think about our economic environment 
and our place in the world and what we do is to think about the United States as an industrial power. You know, you're right, uh, Aubrey, that uh, in the late 19th, early 20th century, that was the, the uh, big wave of immigration to the United States before today, and it was response to, in response to industrialization. Industrialization means making things in factories. We still do make things. Um, we still do make our, our uh, economic pro productivity has increased steadily, but our place in the world economy is changing, and this is reshaping our economy and therefore reshaping our society. As an illustration of that, this is U.S. imports and exports from 1960 to 2007. Uh, the red is imports, and the blue or purple are exports. Imports are things that we buy, essentially things that we buy from other countries. Exports are things that we send to other countries. Now, it's not quite this simple, of course, because with the globalization of the world economy, a lot of businesses say that are headquartered in Japan or Korea or in Europe make things in the United States. Hyundai's, although Hyundai is a Korean car, Hyundai's are made in, I'm not sure, I don't remember whether it's Alabama or Georgia. I think maybe it's, it, it's Alabama, it's uh, on the way to Georgia. Um, so it's not quite this simple, but still, if you look at that, um, the United States still makes things. Right? And we still sell things to the rest of the world. Our exports had grown steadily up to this point, right? We're still making things, we're still selling them to the rest of the world. But if you compare exports to imports, what do you see happening? Yeah, right, we import more than we export. Not only do we import more than we export, but also the gap has been growing, right? Now, that might be part of the backdrop behind what some of the demagogy that we've seen in recent years about changes in our country. But, you know, demagogy is also driven by realities in our life. Yeah, um, imports are increasing more than exports and the gap between them is growing. Now, essentially what that means is that this period of egalitarian capitalism that we associate with big factories run by big corporations producing things for the whole world is beginning to come apart. One of the reasons that it is beginning to come apart is that now things can be produced anywhere and we have more imports than exports because it's often cheaper to buy things that are made elsewhere. I said what that means is that the United States in relative terms no longer has a comparative advantage in hard industry. It doesn't mean we don't make anything anymore. That doesn't mean we don't have any industries in the United States. And in fact, there are a lot of things that need to be made here. Like for example, our houses have to be constructed here. Um, our food often has to be prepared here. But for the most part, we've lost much of our comparative advantage as an industrial power. Now, one consequence of that we had seen before uh, growing inequality. One part of growing inequality is that workers have less power in the workplace when they have to compete in a global market that can undersell them, right? That's not anything necessarily positive or negative. It is good, good for those same workers as consumers if they can buy things 
cheaper. And in fact, you know, the United States is not today in a situation in which um, we're in historical terms in desperate economic circumstances. But you could take this as an indication that the United States no longer has its specialization on a global, on a global scale in the production of industrial goods. So, what does that mean? Where is our comparative advantage today? This is the fire sector, that is finance, insurance, and real estate as percentages of all jobs in the United States and the fire sector as percentages of all of income in the United States. By fire, I mean finance, insurance, and real estate. And what those have in common is that those are all financial occupations, right? They're, they're uh, areas where money is invested. The United States today is less of an industrial power and more of a place where money is invested. Um, and in fact, uh, if you look at this, the fire share of the economy has grown, although both of those have increased, the fire share of the economy has grown more than the fire share of income. Now, more than the fire share of jobs. Now, there's a reason for that. And that is most occupations in finance, insurance, and real estate are knowledge intensive and capital intensive and not labor intensive. That means it takes fewer people, but those fewer people reap greater rewards. Now, getting back to this idea that we made the, we, the categorical inequality was a decision that we made. Therefore, we can make the decision to unmake it. I would say that's really problematic looking at this because one of the things that drives increasing inequality in the United States is the inequality of income where more money goes to people in finance who almost by definition reap much greater rewards than people who live in factories. So much of our inequality is not a consequence only of political decisions, but also changes in the economic environment. That doesn't mean that there aren't responses one could make to this environment. It does mean, though, I think that you can't simply say, we don't like this environment, therefore, we're going to abolish it and institute a new one. Human societies don't work that way. And this is the gross domestic product share of the US financial industry steadily growing. And as you can see here, this is a map of the United States that shows you uh, these bubbles represent how much of the economy is concentrated in these areas. And what you can see here is that wealth in the United States is concentrated primarily on the West Coast and the East Coast, uh, with the exceptions of Chicago, Atlanta, Dallas, and Houston, all urban areas, and most of them financial centers. Of course, Houston also a center of the petroleum industry. So this is the environment that we have to respond to, and it is an environment that promotes greater inequality. Now, there is a, a corollary, I think, of the financialization of an economy. And 
That is what happens when you have an economy that's heavily concentrated in finance. Um, Anika, your, your family, part of your family is from Holland. What kind of flowers do the Dutch like? The Dutch love tulips, right? Um, have tulips played any part in the in Dutch economic history? Yeah, they, a lot of their economy was based on tulip trade, which is a mistake. That's not viable for centuries. But uh, yeah, early on in their trade history, it was really important. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, that's that's one of the what big prime examples of a bubble. Yeah. Um, in the um, I think it was that in the early 16th century, the Dutch began to import tulips, and they like tulips, right? And when people like something, they put their money into it, they buy it, right? And so people began buying tulips. Now, whenever there's a demand for something, the price of it goes up. When you see the price of something going up, the natural consequence is to buy a lot of it because you know that whatever it's worth today, it will be worth more tomorrow, right? And when, you, when people start buying up a lot of anything on speculation about the future, this drives the price up even more. And so tulips acquired a market value that had absolutely nothing to do with their value as bulbs. Well, of course, you know, one of the good things about a bulb is that it's relatively long lasting so that you can keep them. And so people were amassing tulips with not because they wanted to plant them, but because they, there was an investment because the value was going to go up. How do you know the value is going up? The value is going to go up because it's more today than it was yesterday. And so you can assume that it's going to continue to go up. And if the value is going to continue to go up, well, it also makes sense to borrow money to buy more tulips, right? Because, you know, you can always pay back your loans as the value of the tulips goes up. The problem with that was that Someone eventually looked around and said, wait a minute, we've got an enormous amount of money tied up in tulip bulbs. And that person began to sell. Now, when you see someone selling, other people begin to sell. And when people, if, if, when people buy, the price goes up. When people sell, the price goes down. And so as people saw the price going down, they began to say, OK, I better put these tulips on the, on the market because, uh, because the price of it is now going down. So people were dumping their tulips on the market. The market crashed. And for a time, the economy of Holland collapsed because of tulips. Well, that's not something that's unique to the Dutch, right? This is a part of economies everywhere. And that is the urge to speculate, to make more money. The bubble economy is when investments go up beyond the underlying value of the item that's being invested in. Now, what does that have to do with the United States in the 21st century? Are there any things in the United States that people invest in, not because it's worth something today, but because they think it will be worth a lot in the future? Well, the stock market is where they invested, right? The stock market is where they invested. Um, but yeah, I mean, the stock, but, but stocks are themselves also something that you can invest in, right? Um, but uh, the stock market also always invests in companies. Now, we've seen two big bubbles 
in the course of the 21st century, one early on in the tech industry. You know, if the financialization is one part of the economic environment that we face today, the other part is that while the United States no longer has a great comparative advantage in industry, the United States is not only a financial center, but also a center of technical innovation, which is a good thing. And those two things are connected, right? What is it that makes possible technological innovation? It's money that's available for investment because you need to attract investors to develop new technologies. All of the technology that we now enjoy, all of our computers, uh, were, um, all of the software, all of the hardware came about because people were seeking to make money and they attracted investors and those investors put their money into technology. And so the existence of a financial economy is one of the things that pushed the development of technology in the United States. And there is a, an interaction here, right? That is the a thriving financial sector means there's lots of money for technical involved for technical improvement and lots of technical improvement means money that flows back to the financial sector. And so financialization and technification are part of the same thing. In fact, uh, the, the, the three really big areas of the United States today are finance, technology, and entertainment, all of them closely connected to each other. The difficulty is that just like with tulips, whenever you see anything going up in value, there is a, a temptation to put your money into it. And when there's a lot of money flowing into this country, there's a lot of money looking for places for investment. Let's go back to this picture. Um, those imports that are coming into the United States, when they sell things to us, what kind, what kind of currency are they getting? What do we pay with? We pay with dollars, right? So the dollar essentially becomes a world currency. Where's the best place to invest dollars? The United States. The United States is the best place to invest dollars wherever those dollars are coming from. As China emerged as a major economic power, they had dollars. They were looking for a place to invest dollars. Um, other places in the world that were looking for places to invest their money invested in the United States. And Technology was a good place to invest your money. And it wasn't just it wasn't just foreign companies, it was also Americans becoming more involved in the financial sector. I mean, today, virtually all of us in one way or another are involved in stocks and bonds investments through a retirement account uh, or through an, an investment account of some other sort. Now, as all of that money was flowing into technology, essentially the same thing happened in the early 21st century with many of the technology companies that happened with tulips. That is, their market value was inflated far beyond their actual underlying value. And when people began to realize this and began to sell 
there was a market crash. In fact, in the tech boom of the early 21st century, I remember that I lost a lot of money. Well, actually, I only lost it on paper, right? You only lose it till you, you only lose it when you cash in, right? But every account I had went down in value a lot. Right? So if you just stay in, then you know you're just a lot poorer on paper. Um, this, something similar happened later in the 21st century with another item of investment. In 2008, the United States faced its greatest economic downturn in recent history. You know, I think if you uh, go back to the 19th century, late 19, 1890s, uh, you could find you know a greater downturn in relative terms. But by about 2008, the United States faced a sudden and severe downturn. What was it that brought about this sudden and severe downturn? If it was investment in tech stocks earlier, by 2008, the hot item for investment was housing. The hot item for investment was housing. Now, government did play a role here. But government didn't create the market for housing, but government did contribute to events. This is uh, another, um, I think, point about why it is that, that make it so approach to policy doesn't completely work. And that is unforeseen outcomes. You know, government did not intend when it encouraged both when it encouraged investment in mortgages, both to promote the U.S. housing industry and to provide more widespread housing to people who previously had not been homeowners. Government did not intend to bring about a crash. And really to blame U.S. authorities is maybe to expect them to have a greater power to foresee the future than most people actually have. But by 2008, housing had become a boom economy. Almost all housing in the United States is purchased on borrowed money on mortgages. And so to increase the availability of housing, you have to make mortgages more widely available. And it isn't just people who are interested in increasing home ownership who have a part to play in making mortgages more widely available. Also, if there's money out there, money needs to be invested. Where is a place that you can invest it? You could put it in the mortgage industry. Now, it was believed that sophisticated techniques in the financial industry could avoid any kind of crash by taking all mortgages from all sources, and slicing them up and reselling them, they could keep any failure to pay a mortgage from running through the entire market system and avoid a collapse. What actually happened, though, was the same thing that happened with tulip bulbs, the same thing that happened with the, uh, the tech boom, and that is people began to grow uneasy with the market. Some folks who had received mortgages who were not able to keep up with those mortgages began to default. People who were looking at housing and seeing that you know, price of houses always goes up. 
So it doesn't matter how much you pay for it because it's going to be worth more tomorrow. They started borrowing lots of money and buying houses the you know on on pure speculation on the idea that the value was going up. When they started to default, it set off a chain reaction and the housing market crashed and for a time it came very close to bringing down the entire American economy because many of the financial firms concentrated in the East Coast had put a lot of their money into financial instruments connected to housing. So a correlation of the fact that the financialization tends to promote greater inequality is that financialization also lends itself to bubble economies. Now, essentially, you know, what I'm suggesting here is that societies and economies are so complex and are driven by economic forces and driven by social arrangements to the extent that you can't say, this is the kind of society I want. I'm going to design my society to be like this. Because you can't control the environment that you live in. You could respond to it. You might want to raise capital gains taxes, for example, or lower capital gains taxes, right? Those are policy responses. But they're responses, they're not directives that can fundamentally change the whole nature of society. They're also, because they deal with a complex reality, they deal with a world in which tomorrow can always have an outcome that we have not previously predicted. We can have unintended consequences of anything we do. Now, unintended consequences in part are within the complexity of our society and the fact that we respond to an environment rather than control and shape that environment. But also within that social order, People have different goals and different interests, and we, we can't control those goals and interests. Now, here we get to the part of the problem of policy that deals with the issues that Caldas and I were talking about in controls and choices, right? Controls essentially means policies. It essentially means how are you going to design a school system that will bring about equitable outcomes. So, a, not a good goal, right? A good goal. Um, the problem is that you can't control how people will respond to that. Um, in uh, 1955, at the time of the, uh, the second um, Brown decision, Thurgood Marshall said that Within five years, we'll have no segregated schools in the United States. Thurgood Marshall was, was, was a smart man. Um, and so, you know, there's certainly nothing foolish about the belief that if you simply outlaw intentional segregation, you're going to do away with desegregated schools. In other words, you have a policy decision. By 1960, Thurgood Marshall was saying, well, maybe it'll take a bit longer. By the 1970s and 1980s, you still had not created schools that were completely equitable as critics often use that term. 
Now, the argument that we often hear is that this is a policy failure. That this is a result of a failure of will that government, the courts, the legislature did not have the will to push its policies, i.e. its controls, and bring about an equitable system. That's a, a legitimate argument, and it's probably the argument that is most widely accepted. What Caldas and I are, argue, though, is that it's because the, the, the failure to create completely equitable schools was not because primarily because of a failure of will, it was because those controls could not control how people would react. That people reacted to schools as markets. That their primary goal was to seek the best educational outcomes for their own children. They may have also wanted schools to be equitable, but this is a matter of incommensurate goals, incommensurate values, right? Um, you want your schools to be equitable, but you also want the best possible outcomes for your own children. Now think about that for a minute. How many of your parents would have said, we're not going to give Aubrey any advantages in education, because that would be unfair. We're going to send her to the same medium level school that every other student goes to. We're going to give her no advantages that any other child has. Your parents probably didn't do that, did they? No, you know, there's, there's a word for parents who act that, that way, and that is bad parents, right? I mean, you, you might be a good, a good idealistic citizen and also be a bad parent. And so good parenting, in some ways, was at odds with idealistic citizens. And so our argument is not that markets are the ideal approach or a normative argument that uh, free markets are inherently desirable. It's that people will act in response to their own goals and desires, especially when those involve their own children. These are the choices that people make, and those controls can't completely direct those choices. So essentially what we argue is that you couldn't, by, by political fiat, equalize schools because egalitarian schools were not in the interest of many people. Especially they weren't in the interest of people who had some money and power. And no matter how much you lament that fact, it's still the case that people who have some money and power, regardless of what their own ideals may be, will act in their own interests and in the interests of their own children, even if those are inconsistent with goals of equity. Now, essentially, what I've tried to do here is outline why it is that I think that policy is not capable of reorganizing a society and argue why it is that I think that policy responds to social pressures rather than creates a society. Um, that doesn't mean that policy can't do anything. That doesn't mean you can't redistribute income. It doesn't mean that you can't seek more equitable schools. It does mean, though, that you have to be aware that you may not get what you're aiming at. And in fact, you may get the opposite of what you're aiming at. 
unintended consequences means that what you intend to achieve may actually end up being a complete failure and you get the opposite of what you intend to achieve. That it's possible that attempting to racially or economically desegregate schools within a locality can end up segregating communities instead of desegregating those schools because of unintended consequences. Uh, and so, you know, the, the, the conclusion that I would draw through this is not that policy is irrelevant, but that what you can achieve through policy is highly limited and always tentative. 